Hi. Mute Matt. Hi. Paul, thanks so much for being here, man. My pleasure. A pretty uh, tumultuous year for you, I would say, right? It's been crazy. It's been crazy. I didn't see this one coming. But I mean, you put out an incredible album. Thank you. Like an album that seems very different from what you guys have been doing for a while. It feels like you put a lot of your ideas that have come from growing as a band and new ideas about music and maybe working with different people into this album, Play Dead, which is so cool. It's a really a sonic escape, man. It's a really awesome album. Um, you. You'd been working on it for like five years, though, right? Like you've recorded other stuff, but there's stuff on this that you'd been working on for five years? Yeah, a lot of the ideas started about five years ago when we started writing for what became Vitals, actually. And there was a whole bunch of ideas that we just weren't feeling at the time. We knew they were good, so we just stuck them on the shelf. So some of, most of what's on this album just had to sit in the oven. And we came back to it about a year ago, and we're like, I think we know what to do with these now. And the mantra for this album was we wanted to indulge. It was just completely take the guardrails off of what we thought our band was. And the, the slow... Like, what's an example of, of, like, you felt like there were guardrails here and you took that off? What well, the last time we did Vitals was an experiment in minimalism. We wanted to see how many notes we could get away with not playing. This was the exact opposite. We want to see how many notes we can get away with just jamming in there. No fill left behind. Every chord we knew, we put in any harmony stack we wanted to try, we just went for it. And so that was a liberating process for us and it could have only worked I think as album number five you give a young band that sort of mantra and up, you get it's garbage number two and everyone goes oh this is not no and so I, I think because we had built probably a creative trust with each other and it was like yeah man just just go we trust you yeah we trust your taste level and so we just kind of empowered each other that way. It was the only album we've ever done with no outside collaborators. It was just the four of us, the whole way. Wow, no outside collaborators at all. Meaning no, you just mean like no other session musicians or anything like that, but you were produced, right? Like you had No, we produced it ourselves, produced engineered it, mixed it. From start to finish, we did everything. And it was really, uh, yeah, it was empowering. You know, everyone stepped up in the band to uh, take ownership and, and make sure this thing felt right. That's wild, because I feel like it is, uh, in many ways, your most beautifully produced and, and, and mixed and engineered Well, now album. you see, like, I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, Thank it's you. A, it's, it's, it doesn't feel stripped back. It doesn't feel like anyone held you back. And it feels really wide open in terms of the sounds that you're playing with. Thank you, man. Yeah, absolutely. So you make this album, uh, you feel liberated, you feel like a new band, and then, and you've had to tell this story so many times, and then just before you're about to go on tour in support of this album, uh, your, one of your main collaborators who you started the band with, your drummer, calls you up and tells you he's out. Correct. Yeah, and it was right after the bass player had decided... He's out. He's out. <laughs> or just wasn't going to tour anymore. He wasn't going to tour. So we had brought in a new uh, bass player. And then shortly after that, uh, the drummer, who was the guy that founded the band with, and it was just he's been my creative soulmate for 15 years. Incredible like, drummer, too. An so. amazing drummer. Uh, said he, he was done um, and just needed out. And it was tough. It was really tough. Yeah, I was, I was pretty devastated. We had a tour booked. The album was slated to come out, and um, half the band was gone. So, yeah, I was pretty stressed out, to say the least, trying to figure out what do we do? Maybe it's time to just call it. Um, are you comfortable with potentially making... I mean, obviously, you're touring in support of this album, but right. are you comfortable in making more Mute Math albums I don't know. Tour? I don't know yet. Um, it's all still too fresh to really know. I, I can't imagine making a Mute Math record without Darren. And in all fairness to the situation, maybe, maybe time will heal things. I don't know. Maybe we just need time apart right now. You can so, pull them back in? I don't know. I don't know. Um... But at this point, I'm trying to stay focused on, on what's at hand, which is I think we have a really good album, and I wanted to do all I could to get it on stage, get it in front of people, and, and bring this album to life. And I called an old friend on a long shot. Um, and he was the only guy that I knew of that I felt could actually play the parts. I mean, Darren King, does, does everyone know Darren? I mean, this, okay, hey, of course. Um, I'm seeing some familiar faces here. Um, Darren, uh, I mean, he's defined a role in our band. I mean, he is a, a mainstay fixture. I mean, and what he's done with drumming and, um, and what that means to Mute Math songs is a huge thing. Um, there was only one drummer I knew could even play the parts and try to cover it. 
And I called him on a whim. He's a New Orleans drummer. And he, I used to play in a band with him 15 years ago. Um, and I, actually, Darren moved to New Orleans to fill in for this guy when he first came to New Orleans. Um, his name's Hutch, David Hutchison. And he's been a paramedic for the past 15 years. And, and I called him a long shot because I just didn't know if he even wanted to get back into music. Now his life is kind of a certain thing. And now coming into this sort of, which would be a highly scrutinized opportunity of who's going to fill in for Darren, who, could, who would possibly think to do that. And, um, and Hutch was up for it. He was like, I, I want to do this. I've, I've been dreaming just for an opportunity to play music again. And he had refashioned his life to try to get back into it this year. So it worked what out. What an opportunity to come his way. I mean, so he had yeah. three weeks. He I sent him like two hours of music. Like, and it's not just two hours of boom. I mean, if you mute Matt's songs, it's just a drum clinic for, for two hours. And so <laughs> he, he woodshedded him and the bass player, and they just built the bond and um, learned the music in three weeks and then saved the tour. So I'm really grateful of those so guys. So they learned the music in three weeks. It wasn't like an audition. You sent them the tape, they learned the music, and then you guys go on tour? Do you, do you, do you jam it all together beforehand? Or you yeah, then we did a week of rehearsals. We did a week of rehearsal before just we went to Europe. Europe. Yes, with, with the whole band. So everyone kind of prepared their parts on their own. And uh, yeah, it was very stressful, <laughs> but it was, it was exciting. And you know, <clears throat> that's when the, the history, I'm, I'm a firm believer in just putting together a bunch of talented musicians doesn't necessarily make for a good musical experience. There's something about, I think, the subtext of relationships, of chemistry, and it's just how everyone complements each other personality-wise, and it somehow plays through in the music that you'll create together and um, the chemistry we'll have on stage. And so that, I think, helped us because of the history that uh, was already there with Hutch. He wasn't a complete stranger who came in. And, and Jonathan is someone who actually played on the first Reset EP that Mute Math made and was an original bass player for us and had been playing in a band with Hutch for the past 15 years, just little local band things. And um, so there was, some, there was a foundation there. And which we were that, able to build off. Did that sort of help take away from the potential feeling of like, okay, now I'm leading this band to support an album and it's like really the job that I've got to get done now that you, you, kept, you continued to have a kind of family around you? Absolutely, and that, that's what made it more fulfilling and I think made me feel like it was the right thing to do to at least give this a shot because the stars had aligned. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. Well, I called Jonathan, he was working in a kitchen. Um, it's like, man... Roy's not going to tour anymore. Would you like to come do this? And he was just so excited, like, damn right. And he hangs up the, yes, quits I his quit. job. <laughs> it's like, let's go, you know, let's join the circus. And it was the same thing with Hutch, getting to call him and say, would you, would you like to tour? You know, we got the rest of the year. You can play drums with us. Absolutely. And it was just, so all friends bringing them into what's an amazing experience to be able to travel around and play shows is it's been, it's been wonderful the past few weeks. Were you worried about having to go into a tour or go into this band follow, uh, after Darren and Roy left and being like a kind of um, a de facto leader, like original leader, rather than having like multiple leaders of the band who started the band together, suddenly you become the guy who's the driving force of the whole thing? Um, I, well, it, it's not so much about that, but as, as Marvel, I just feeling like the problem. I just feel like, you know, the cheese stands alone, right? Yeah. I'm the only original member kind of left, and um, I think mentally getting past the whole fact of, God, is this all my fault? What, what unraveled, could, what could I have done to hold it together, and I thought I was doing, and just getting past that and just realizing that it's just a natural, perhaps, step in evolution for everyone's career. You grow past certain things, and everyone needs to do different things at certain times, and um, I think once I was able to wrap my head around the psychology of something that seemed healthy, and I became appreciative of what was around me. Um, it became invigorating, and let's just make music, let's put on a show, and uh, that was it. Did you notice anything? I mean, you said, uh, you kind of alluded to this, but did you notice anything during the recording of uh, Play Dead that made you feel like things were maybe unraveling a little bit, or anything like that, or was it all kind of a big surprise? It was a surprise, we were having the time of our life. No, I mean, this was, <laughs> This was the most liberating, undaunting time in the studio we've had as a band that I can remember. Um, and everyone was set free. There was no, don't do this, don't, you know, it's like, whatever you want to try. And it just, it was all about following your bliss. Again, the, it was indulged. That was the mantra of this album. So 
we were just pushing each other to just, man, do your best. We're not, we're not worried about making songs that have to fit in a formula. It's, it's not about any commercial pressures. This is just us just making something that we think sounds sick. When and you go into the studio and you do that and you want to make something that sounds sick, sick what are your sort of ten pole albums? What are your, you know, your go-to kind of like, if I'm going to have this freedom, <coughs> I want it, you know, this is sort of what I, this is my, uh, not my goal necessarily, but, you know, the thing that I hold up as the great free album that artists made. Well, I mean, there's a lot of albums that have influenced this. I'll tell you one thing. Darren brought... Um, the you can get the the multi tracks for like Beatles recordings. I started releasing those like years ago, and you can just bring them into your DAW, and you can like look at all the the drums for Helter Skelter and the George the Martin vocals. Yeah. Like, yeah, and when I when we started realizing, we're looking into some of those Beatles recordings and how great everything sounded, and and what they were doing with eight tracks, perhaps on some of that, it's like man, we're not even trying. I mean, this is just. Paul McCartney gut himself, take after take, doing pitched vocals that you didn't really even hear in the mix so much, but it was all these little nuances, things that were laying in there. Um, and these guys going the extra mile to figure out how to bounce it down to another mix, another mix, and a, to keep stacking things and just make this eventful recording. The Beatles are such a, Those are the things that we wanted to try. They're such a strange band, right? And I mean, <clears throat> this is not going to sound right at first. Let me get to it. Uh, because they are the Beatles and everybody loves the Beatles. But because <coughs> everybody loves the Beatles so much, like everybody loves the Beatles, people often forget how layered and beautiful and like sort of magical that music is and how much they worked on it. They think of the Beatles as like, love, love me do, or like, you know, hey Jude. But then when you like listen to hey Jude or some of those albums with headphones on, you're like, fuck, this stands the test of time. It's incredible what they're yeah. doing. It's, I mean, so to go into the studio and have that as kind of like, was that the idea? It was like, let's just play with all the sounds that we can. Absolutely. And I think one thing that we've always been after when we start our drum, me, me and Darren bonded over crazy drum sounds. Now, in the 90s, there was... There like Rush. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a thing that was happening in the 90s. This is when me and Darren first started working together, where live drums, I felt like, were not an exciting thing. There were very few bands that... It was mainly about what was happening in electronic music for drums that was really moving us. Um, you know, we were always a fan of The Roots and what those guys were doing and how they were emulating program style but I mean Quest Love what a master of of drums I remember seeing a Roots show and you talk about a, a guy you know Quest Love he's a very educated musical guy and uh, and a producer of Sonic Master and watching him perform I remember seeing him the first time at House of Blues in New Orleans and these guys are going from song to song they're doing covers just like a DJ dropping in different you know they did a Beyonce tune and then they went to um Nelly and and he was like doing things in between songs to change the sound of his drums and how he would play it and he'd throw a towel on it or he'd take the, the, the padding off and all of a sudden the drum sound was sounding like the record, like he was just mastering it. And those type of things was the stuff that was blowing me in Darren's mind, like, like to really dive into just not just throwing up a few mics in a studio and just stock drum sound. Uh, bands like The Flaming Lips, um, we're big fans of Nigel Godrich, everything he did with Beck and Radiohead and all this stuff that was happening late 90s and, and then uh, the sampled music. Yeah, Radiohead's drummer never gets enough credit, I think, as well, or just sort of referenced enough. Like that stuff Shame. and uh, oh, Phil. OK and After, unbelievable. Yeah, no, absolutely. So th that was the stuff that really became the foundation of what we're setting out for Mute Math Records, just how to just push drum sounds to new places. And that's what we've tried to do on every record. So it must have... I'm going to go back to this phase of it must have destroyed you to a degree when, when Darren called you up and said, he thank you. To do We're it. going back to that. I'm yeah. sorry, but to be like to start at the band, it was all about drumming. And then a minute ago, we we're talking about the drummer leaving. No, absolutely. And I'll tell you as angry as I was, as devastated as I was, what did you say when he called you and said, like, what was the first word out of your mouth? I said, you gotta be fucking kidding me. I don't know if you can't, <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying, I'm, honestly, that's what I said. Yeah. There's no way this is happening. Um, and we talked through it. We tried to find solutions, and um, there was none. And and I, I came around to understanding why, and it was, it was it needed to happen. 
Um, and I, I support him and I wish him the best. And, you know, he's in full support of what we're doing and just trying to make this record still work. Um, he loves Hutch. He's endorsed the show and um, wished us the best from his side. Um, but it's tough. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure what's next. I don't, I don't know if a Mute Math record can happen without Darren yet. Record, I mean, this record works beautifully, by the way, Thank too. You. you know, you say, you know, he wanted to support the record and make sure it works. It, it really works. And this, what if this was, I hope it's not, if this was the record to go out on, it's an amazing accomplishment. And that's, that was my takeaway. And in the end, I just became, you know, if this is the last record, I'm very appreciative of it. And I think this was everyone in the band firing on all cylinders. We captured it. And, um, and I've made my peace with it. And so let's just, let's just, do the best we can with it right now, and I'm um, thankful for every moment we have to be in front of people and playing it. Absolutely. Let's get some questions from the audience, and I'm going to set a quick rule. No questions about Darren. I covered it. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Thank you for being here. Cheers. So what, what special advice would you give to people that's trying to make a band and uh, overall individual music? When you started, what advice would you give to them? Never play the board game Risk. And I've said this a few times. Um, I can laugh about it now. This, I'm sorry, this is, is rabbit trailing here. Um, Hutch left the first band after a game of Risk. <laughs> and I learned a lesson. Don't, don't do that. What is it about that devil's game? It just unearths some awful things. It always, that one in Monopoly, I think, those are the games that just end with the board getting flipped over and someone quitting. They quit the band, or it's like, I'm out of here. Uh, but seriously, it's really about trying to do, uh, what is it, team building exercises? Risk is not a team building exercise. Um, but other than that, which is just, I guess, good practical advice. I'm serious, that, that's real advice. Um, although we stopped playing Risk, and I still lost three guys in the band, so I don't know. Maybe I, I don't know what I'm talking about. But one thing I will say is, I, I think... As long as you're enjoying the music you're making, that's it, man. I mean, that's all, that's all you get to control in the journey. If you're lucky enough to ever get a record deal or there's people that come on board to help you book shows and manage you and then all the things you're going to have to do in the extracurricular. And, um, you know, we always talk about that tax time in, in bands when you got to pay your tax, which is basically, all right, we got to write the bio. We got to write the bio again. And uh, T-shirt designs or, or just the things that's like, you just wind up letting go, and it's just whatever. But at the end, the source of life, the thing that keeps you going is just getting in headphones, getting some chords going, getting a beat going, and just writing songs. And you just try to do that as best you can. And I feel like that's always been a valid means of therapy. And just, you know what? I just keep my head down and just make good music. Whatever I think is good music, the rest of that stuff seems to sort itself out. Next question. Hey, Paul. Uh, so when you're touring, do you enjoy playing some of the more newer music that, you know, like with your new album coming out, do you prefer to perform those than some of the older songs that maybe some of the fans want to hear? Uh, it's 50-50, quite honestly. Um, because there's something about even old songs, when you, when you feel that it means something to the audience, it's, it's a, it is a new song in that moment. Um, and it's just as fresh as the new song you're actually playing. So I, I've, I've grown to appreciate both of it, being able to implement new songs and watching those begin to take life and evolve. And, and still, yeah, we, we mess with old songs too. We arrange them here and there. And I feel like we've never played Blood Pressure the same way since it came out five years ago. We always, it seems to be a song that's in constant experiment. So it's always, yeah, it's been about reinventing. And, but, I, I, yeah, I'm not partial to either. I, I like them both. Uh, I think I have time for one more right here. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what's your favorite song to play on your new album? On the new album right now, it's Achilles' Heel. That one is really fun. Uh, and that's, that's probably the, the slow burner on this one. It's like a seven-minute track. And when, when I talk about indulge, as far as the mantra for this new album, that was a song that we did that wholeheartedly, um, and it's really fun live. So I think it goes through a lot of dynamics in our band that we enjoy. Um, 
within a two hour show and kind of found a way to condense it into seven minutes. Thank you. Paul, talk to me before I let you go. Talk to me about this, this, this cover right here. You, you, it's amazing. Yeah, this is Darren. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is Darren's. This is Darren's last great contribution to the band before he. Did you think I knew that when I was going? <laughs> no, I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, yeah, no, we we were looking for an album cover for a while. Darren went silent for like a week, and then he sent this out to us. I'm like, it's beautiful. It's perfect. It's perfect. But no, he's a great visual artist as well. Damn it. <laughs> Paul, uh, congratulations uh, on the album. You're touring right now, right? You just did Brooklyn Steel last night. How many more shows do you have right now across the country? Uh, about 25, 25. 25 shows across the country. Yeah. I'd imagine they're all sold out, but guys, go online, go to Mute Math's website, look for tickets in a city near you. Paul Meany, everybody, give it up. Cheers. Thank you, guys.